If there's one thing we know how to do here in Appalachia, it's telling tales. And that's only natural, cause we got a lot of folklore all its own. Made up of monsters, ghosts, jack tales, and a whole lot more. Sit back and listen now as we tell you all the lore of these mountains. You're listening to Mountain Lore, Tales from Appalachia. Today we tell a folk tale about an old witch. A witch, you say? That brings a dead hog back to life. Woo! Now that's something we haven't done before. Yeah, interesting, (laughs) Steve. Now this is an old tale that goes all the way back to England which then came to Appalachia with the settlers and has since moved on west with the settlers to places like the Ozarks and Arkansas and Texas and all that. We have one version. There's probably, I don't know, five or six versions of this story. Uh huh. We have picked this one version, and we want to tell it to folks today. Oh, good. Are you ready? I'm ready. Well, way back in the hills, deep in the woods, sat a little old cabin. And that cabin is where what they used to call a granny woman lived. Now, her name was Betty, although most called her Old Betty because, well, Gina, she was old. And some say right ugly, too, with crossed eyes and a big hooked nose. But age and beauty didn't matter, for Old Betty was known throughout the community as the best conjuring woman in the area. And inside that little cabin, she'd collected herbs, roots, and bottles filled with potions she'd cooked up with conjuring medicine. Not only that, she had books. Strange-looking books filled with magical spells. Some less charitable people in town said she wasn't a granny woman at all. She was just a plain old witch. Uh Either way, she was avoided, if not outright feared, and had very, very few friends. Well, I guess I misspoke. She did have one friend, one who lived at her place. And this friend, though, ran around on four legs because it was a mean, tough old razorback hog that ran wild. Now, the hog rooted through her garbage and ate all her roots, potions, and leftover spells, and some of the folks around there said that the hog ate so much of those magic potions that it could walk upright and talk, just like a human being. <laughs> in fact, Gina, I heard that one fellow said he'd seen that hog sitting in the rocker on old Betty's porch, chatting with her to beat the band while she was cooking up some magic on her cook stove. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, mind you, but that's just what I heard. Rawhead was the name old Betty gave the Razorback, referring maybe to the way the ugly creature looked a bit like some of the dead pigs come butchering time down in Hogscald Hollow. Well, the Razorback didn't mind the funny name. Rawhead just followed old Betty around her little cabin and rooted up the kitchen leftovers. He'd even walked to town with her when she came to the general store to sell her home remedies, just like the family dog. Hmm. Well, folks in town got so used to seeing Rawhead and old Betty around the town that everyone thought it strange when one day around hog driving time, old Betty came to the store without him. Where's Rawhead? The store owner asked as he took a bag full of Betty's remedies. I ain't seen him around today and I'm awful worried. You seen him here in town? And yeah, nobody's seen him around today. They'd have told me if they did. We'll keep a lookout for him. Thank you so much. If you see him, tell him to come straight home. The shopkeeper agreed, then handed her payment for her delivery. Old Betty headed back home, upset and worried about Rawhead. I wouldn't like him for that hog to just disappear, especially on the day they made the trip to the general store, since the shopkeeper always saved scraps for him. When the old conjuring woman got home, she mixed up a potion and poured it into a flat plate. Where's that old hog got to? She asked the liquid. As she stared at the plate, it clouded over, and then a series of pictures formed. First, old Betty saw a man's image appear. As the image came into focus, she recognized him as the man who lived on the next ridge, and frankly, that got her just a bit worried. Mm. See, Gina, that man was a hunter, and he had a reputation as a hog rustler, known for sneaking around the woods and rounding up hogs that didn't belong to him. In the plate, she saw him catch Rawhead, along with a bunch of other pigs. What she saw next enraged old Betty. Mm. She saw the man take those hogs, along with Rawhead, down to what the locals in the next town called Hogscald Hollow, where hogs were killed and slaughtered, 
and then taken to that town for sale. Then she saw her precious raw head slaughtered with the rest of the pigs and hung up for gunning. The final picture in the liquid was the pile of bloody bones that had once been her pig and his scraped clean head lying with the other hogsheads in a pile. This was nothing but murder as far as Betty was concerned, and by God or by Satan or by whomever, she was going to administer some justice. That lazy hog thief was going to pay for killing her best friend. Mm. Old Betty had, up till now, kept her conjuring to white magic, making potions that help folks. That was now going to change. Oh. She happened to have in her extensive library an old secret book handed down to her by her granny. She pulled out that book and turned to the very last page. She then pulled out of a cabinet drawer several candles and carefully placed them around the plate that had Rawhead's image, now consisting of that head scraped nearly clean and those bloody bones. She lit the candles and began to chant, Raw head and bloody bones! Raw head and bloody bones! Suddenly it grew dark on the mountain. Ominous clouds blew into the clearing where old Betty's cabin stood, and the howl of dark spirits could be heard in the wind that pummeled the treetops. She continued the chant. Raw head and bloody bones! Raw head and bloody bones! Betty continued chanting her spell until a bolt of lightning left the plane and streaked out through the window heading in the direction of Hogscald Hall. When the silver light struck Rawhead's severed head, it tumbled from the hunter's wagon to the ground and rolled until it was touching the bloody bones that had once inhabited its body. As the hunter rolled away toward the ridge where he lived, the enchanted Rawhead called out, Bloody bones, get up and dance! Immediately, the bloody bones reassembled themselves into the skeleton of a razorback hog walking upright on two legs just as Rawhead had done when he was alone with old Betty. The head hopped on top of the skeleton, and Rawhead went searching through the woods for weapons to use against the hunter. He borrowed the sharp teeth of a dying panther, the claws of a long-dead bear, and the tail from a rotting raccoon and put them over his skinned head and bloody bones. Rawhead was ready for vengeance. Oh, it knew where the hunter lived up on the next ridge, and he promptly headed in that direction, determined to find the hunter who'd killed and butchered him. Soon he came up on the hunter in his wagon and quietly slipped past him and went into the barn and climbed up in the loft to wait for him to pull in. It was almost dark when the man got his wagon into the barn and unhitched his horse. He sensed something was up, though, when the horse snorted in fear, but that horse sensed Rawhead was close at hand. Trying to figure out what was up with his horse, the hunter looked around to see if there might be a snake or something that might have spooked her. When he turned his gaze up to the loft, he saw a rather large pair of eyes staring back at him from the darkness. Thinking it must be one of the neighbor kids playing a trick on him, he hollered up to the figure in the loft. I can see you up there. What you got those big eyes for? To see your grave. Oh, very funny. Ha <laughs> ha. When he came out of the stall, the hunter saw Rawhead had crept forward a bit further. Now his luminous yellow eyes and his bear's claws could clearly be seen. Well, what you got those big claws for? You look ridiculous. To dig your grave. Those last words sent a chill down the hunter's spine. <laughs> Was this really one of those kids? And if so, how'd he make his voice like that? What if it wasn't a kid? What the hell was it then? Suddenly scared, he rushed toward the door and left the barn, followed silently by Rawhead, who climbed down from the loft right behind him. Rawhead ran through the woods, quiet as a mouse, and up the path to a large rock, which was lit by the full moon. He hid in the shadow of the boulder so that all that could be seen were his glowing yellow eyes, his bear claws, and his raccoon tail. And there he waited. Soon the hunter came up the path, when he got to the rock, he spotted those eyes again. You nearly knocked the heart right out of me, you crazy kid. What is that, a coon's tail? Why have you got that for? To sweep your grave. There was no waiting around this time. The hunter took off in total terror, headed on for his cabin as fast as he could go. He passed his well house, the wood pile, the fence, and finally made it into the yard. But as fast as he ran, Gina, Rawhead ran faster and was at the cabin when the hunter got there. As soon as he reached what he thought was safety, the porch, 
Out jumped Rawhead right up in his face, looming over him. This time there was no way the man was going to mistake this beast for one of the neighbor kids. He slowly looked up and saw hell before him. What he saw was that raw head with the bright yellow eyes, with a bloody skeleton, bear claws, raccoon's tail, and sharp panther teeth. What, what you got those big teeth for? They eat you up like you wanted to eat me. At that, raw head got hold of the murderous hunter. The man let out one long, ah! bloody scream in the moonlight. After that, the only sound to be heard was the sound of punching. Mm. Nobody knew whatever happened to that hunter, or his horse for that matter, since it too disappeared that night. It's said, though, that once a month when the moon is full, you can still spot raw head and bloody bones riding the hunter's horse through town, wearing the man's blue overalls over his bloody bones. In his bloody, bear-clawed hands, he'd be seen carrying his raw hog's head, lifting it high against the full moon for everyone to see. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> now, that's just one version of that story. Oof. There's a whole bunch. This story goes all the way back to the 1500s in England. Ah. One of the first mentions, by the way, of this horrifying pair, raw head and bloody bones, came from a of all things, a sermon in 1566 in which an Anglican minister warned that, quote, hell and the devil, end quote, needs to be taken at least as seriously as grandmother's tale of bloody bone, raw head, and werewolves. Hmm. And there's at least one nursery rhyme, folks, about this nighttime terror that comes from Yorkshire and shows that this story served up scares to children for centuries. Gina, won't you read that for us? Sure. Raw head and bloody bones steals naughty children from their homes, takes them to his dirty den, and they are never seen again. Ooh. 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 <laughs> That'll keep a child straight, right? Uh, I would think so. Well, maybe. And that, folks, is the story of raw head and bloody bones. Another bit of mountain lore for you. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to the Mountain Lore Podcast at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, Radio Public, TuneIn, and on most other podcast apps. As always, sweet dreams, podcast listeners.